about the Hebrew. Well, thank you. I'm pleased to, hear, to be here and uh, I'm going to talk about the history of the total hip arthroplasty register and the clinical benefit for the individual department and the surgeon. And I think that's actually what the hip arthroplasty register is aiming for to constantly and online improve the results on the individual unit. I want to acknowledge the present leaders, Joran Garelik and Johan Karolm, and of course, Henrik Malka, who is sitting here, who was my close co-worker for so many years, and the entire register staff. I think we can say that this is a prospective observational study that started in 1979, and from the beginning, we actually had all departments with us. How come that we managed to do that? Well, it was related to a pilot study that we started in 1976 using research money that I initiated. And uh, then it turned out that we could actually get enthusiasm from all departments. So in the long run, I think we have changed the practice of total hip replacement and I will try to show how that happened. It's interesting that the idea of a national registry was actually not born in Sweden. I found this internal publication from Wrightington some years ago, and he actually wrote in 1972 that he wanted to establish a central register to keep a finger on the pulse of total hip implant surgery on a nationwide basis. I think what we try to do is to have an intensive ward checking the total hip replacements. The mission is to improve the general outcome of total hip replacement. That's the whole mission and to establish a continuing learning process. And as Henrik also said today, this is not an implant register. We want to check and control the whole procedure. And we want to give public information of the results online and also feed it back to the profession. If you look on the early period from 1979 to 1991, we had limited data collection and everyone now who approaches me from Russia or from any country asking how to do, I say start with a limited data collection. We collected primary total hips and operative technique, which is extremely important from every department from the beginning. Reoperations and revisions in detail by medical records and we could calculate survival curves by using other death registers and do assumptions. In the later period from 92, we have increased the data collection. We started with individual social security number on the primaries and especially on implant parts. We actually have details of the implant parts since 1999, even on the surfaces, Henrik, uh, so we can have that. And in 2002, we introduced the patient-related outcome measurements. How do the patient really feel about the operation? What's their general health, their pain and satisfaction? As we have heard before, the most important feature for the success of this particular register is that we went to the internet in 1991. And all data collection and feedback is through this site. And you could go there. And it's no doubt that this made the further success and we actually became a sort of a role model for all quality registers in Sweden. What we do is that we feed back our results and that's the most essential feature for compliance. Why should orthopedic surgeons and their departments send in their data if they don't get them back and if they don't get valid data back that they know are reliable? And that makes also continued clinical responsibility and accountability feasible. The recent figure is that we have now 350,000 primary total hips and more than 30,000 revisions in the register. And we have seen this figure before that we have been very conservative with mostly cemented implants, although at the top we have some new implant designs like uncemented implants and even hip resurfacing. We have had two levels of definition for failure. The traditional and very simple is that you are reoperated or you are revised. The patients, of course, suffer and we think it's a disaster. Also now we have identified patients that are not satisfied 
and have low health-related quality of life since 2002. I would say that these two groups are probably equally big. If you have a failure rate of 5% at 10 years with revision, you probably have at least another 5-7% that are not satisfied. The result of this continuous outcome assessment and spreading of result is a constant improvement of the results in Sweden, and that is something that really learned the orthopedic surgeon that they could improve. We went from 85% to 95% non-revised patients over these time periods. And how did that come on? Well, we did learn by survival statistics that some implants did not work. And we also now know that we have been able to convince the orthopedic surgeons in Sweden to be conservative. And more than 50% used three cemented implant combinations during the last period. And I think that's one important reason for success. Why shouldn't a standard patient age 70 and over have an implant where we have track record of 20 years or more? And you can see why we convinced the surgeons. Well, of course, it's quite clear. Oh, my God. You've gooed back here. It's quite clear from this figure here that you see that the revision burden of the cemented implants are completely flat. So it's no doubt that this is working very well, in spite of the fact that we have an increasing number of hip replacements walking around in Sweden. On the contrary, we see that when we tried the uncemented, there was an increasing revision burden. We had the failures of the 90s that Henrik Malka alluded to. But over the recent years, we do have success with some parts of the cementless system, especially the stems, and we now use it increasingly, and even furthermore in Norway and Denmark. And here is an example of a stem in blue line showing a survival of more than 98% over 10 years which is ex excellent. The most important reason for improvement, however, in Sweden, and the reason for why we are different from many other countries, is that we know how we have done the operation from the beginning. We know how we change our practice. We educated very early in our teaching courses. You should use that and that and that. And we could show statistics that if you don't use pulsative levage, proximal femoral seal, or, or femoral plugging, you will increase the risk for loosening, a septic loosening with 25% for each step. Thereby, we became very uniform in all the departments very early in Sweden. And it has been published figures that, for instance, in Great Britain, the diversity of surgical technique has remained enormous. So you can see here how we actually came about with this. We got rid of the bad implants like the Christiansen, a very old example. And we went from first, third, to th second to third generation. And we decreased the cumulative frequency of revision over the years from almost 25% in the old days down now to well below 10%. So this is a combination of effects. Over the later period, we have more information, we have improved reliability, improved result, but more narrow tolerances. Johan Karam has performed in-depth analysis, he will talk more about that tomorrow, I think. But as just as an example, on one stem, if you look on the various sizes, it's quite clear that it's one size who is performing badly. It's so small, it can't resist the torsional forces in femur, and it fails. Also here, if you use the uncemented stem in a reversed hybrid, you see that you have fractures in the first years due to surgical technique problem. This is a more difficult operation, needs more training, more experience, and we have a problem because we have more narrow tolerances. Another thing that's very important, and I think that's also rather unique because we have the internet application, is that we went public with our data. We did it with the first report in 1999. It was partly caused by external pressure. It was TV and press and media who accused me. We had a battle at the court. They wanted the data from every hospital and we refused. We won that first battle, but we also realized that we had to go prophylactically 
in the front line and publish our data to reduce the sensational value. And in our mind, the primary idea of that was also to force the individual departments to really see their data and to improve if they didn't do very well. I think uh, Lars mentioned briefly the, Nash, the Nordic Arthroplasty Register Association and that we, 30 years ago, introduced our register, 20 years ago the Norwegian and uh, 15 years ago the Danish. And uh, when we compiled our data and actually made a very thorough analysis in the correct way, we can see that Sweden has the highest survival like we had on the knee, followed by Norway and finally Denmark, and these curves are narrow, but there are significant differences. I can't see anything, but that we have, since we have used over time, both cemented and cementless, that the effect of this continuous difference over time is related to the effect of the register. It's also interesting if you compare two Nordic registers with the United States in blue. And this was published in 2007, and we can calculate that this difference between Sweden and the United States has saved approximately one million Swedish kroner to the healthcare providers in Sweden because of reduced number of revisions. So there is a lot of money in the register for the public community. The Recent re register improvement since 2002, as I mentioned in the beginning, is to increase the sensitivity for failure definition. We capture patient-related outcome measurements, such as general health-related quality of life, pain, satisfaction, and we do this on a, with a web-based registration. And we also try to get some information about comorbidity using the Charnley classification in order to create a case mix indicator. The university hospitals have different patients from the smaller hospitals and we must be aware of that. We used visual analog scales for pain and satisfaction and EQ5D for general health. The EQ5D is self-reported easily with five dimensions. It gives an index from zero to one, a figure that you can use when you feed data back and also use for economical calculations. And this project implies follow-up, pre-op, one year, six year, ten years, or what the patients believe from the operation. And it's, we use touchdown screen technology on most of the outpatient departments. That's very easily done, paperless, time-saving, and no missing values because they cannot leave one question out. And this is, has facilitated this procedure in the whole country. You can see some result here. You can actually see the result from one department against the whole country. You can see that after one year, they obtained 0.69 in the UK 5D index in the whole country, it was this figure, and what you gained was 0.36. And the result here, what does it say? When, if you compare it to an age and gender matched population of page or normal individuals around 70 or elderly, it's actually the same figure. So what we do is that we normalize our patient's quality of life with this operation. Finally, I want to mention that we need faster indicators. We want to know not only what happens in the five and ten years and what the patient believes, we really need hard facts. And we need faster indicators like reoperation with one or preferably two years. Why do we think that is important? Because we can get information back earlier that you are not doing well, but also because these early complications are serious. That's the dislocation, the deep infections with high patient morbidity, technically demanding, very expensive, and often with bad patient-related outcome. And there are differences. And I think now when we publish our data on the web, and my talk is to stimulate you to go to our website and look into that, we have the standard information of five and 10 years survival. We have reoperation at two years, satisfaction, pain, general health, 90-day mortality and cost. 
That enabled us to create what we call the clinical value compass or Verde compass. And it's taken from the Dartmouth Medical School. And you can see that we can here put all the various parameters in this compass. In Sweden, a sort of a balancerat scorecard. You can see here when we have the mean in Sweden looking like this, and the best data is in the periphery, we have all these factors that I talked about delineated. And every department in the annual report and even online consistently can see their own results. They can realize immediately, hi, we are not doing well. We have much higher reoperations within two years and we have bad patient satisfaction. And because this is public, you must do something about this. As an example, the department in Sundsvall participated with the register in a study when they saw these figures the first time, and they actually said very nicely, we have no clue that we had this problem. A high amount of early problems, as you can see here. It was mainly dislocations, because they get this figure back they say that we have almost 5% in the country in general, it's 1.4% of reoperation within two years. What's happening? Well, it's dislocation, 3% instead of 0.5%. They analyzed all their cases, they draw their conclusions, they started a program to get rid of their problems, and within a couple of years they had zero dislocation. Here you can see from our recent report that you will soon get, that a small hospital with nice patients, no problem cases, you can see that they are actually doing better than the mean. The university hospitals, and we only compare university hospitals with university hospitals, they have problems because they have more difficult cases, and that's obvious. But this case mix must be taken into account, and it's difficult to do, to be fair, to, to compare apples with apples but we are constantly working on that. The goal with the open disclosure of clinical result is to initiate the learning process and improvement at each department. Of course, we also write articles, but I mean, this facility is online for the de departmental chief and those responsible for hip re replacement surgery to look at it consistently. And finally, some words about cost and utility. We can have a health economical evaluation by dividing the costs with the gained health-related quality of life and multiply with duration. Do we know the cost? Yes, we do know from cost per patient databases, which are implemented in most counties in Sweden today. It's approximately 78,000 Swedish kroner. Health-related quality we can get here in the whole country. You can see the one-year result here. And we know it works for 10 years with a very secure, good success. And then you can calculate it that the cost for a quality adjusted life for this operation is 22,000 Swedish kroner. What does it say? Well, if you go to the literature and some old league tables, it's no doubt that this among surgical proce procedure is among the most cost effective. Pacemaker treatment is cheaper. Neurosurgical intervention for bleeding is cheaper, but all other surgical interventions. We need that data as well when we compete with other medical disciplines, and I think the register is a very valuable tool for the orthopedic units. So it's not only one of the best operations. We normalized our patients' general health. It's also one of the most cost-effective. We can, and we need to monitor our technique and describe our results and changing practice continuously to be accountability. We need to provide this information public to all parties. So I want to conclude by saying that outcome assessment through the register has had a profound impact on hip replacement surgery. This is a continuous process and it's interesting to see that in the last report from the Norwegian register they are worried they are worried because they see tendencies going badly. There are several factors they think contribute to that, but we must be consistently aware of the changing practice and be able to take
precautious measures. There is an enormous potential for clinical research. We have had 10 clinical dissertations, 70 public papers from the register. And I think I showed you that for the healthcare providers, large economic savings and public information is available. For the orthopedic community, I think uh, they have the data they need, confidential and public. And for the individual surgeons, as we have heard from Lars and from Henrik previously, it's also so that in this situation, what shall this orthopedic surgeon do? Well, he must answer that question and he needs good facts. He needs to know what works, what works in my department and what are we doing. That's the only way where they can meet, that they have equally good information and that he has the most sound information. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Peter. Do you have questions for Peter Herbert? <laughs> Peter, why do you think they, the reverse hybrid 